Okay, so I'm going to get started on the next portion. <laughs> so if you if you ran uh, the code, um, you would notice that it doesn't actually work very well, and uh, it's actually quite hard to get uh, to get very good results from um, from policy grading. Uh, meaning that um, they usually take a very large number of samples. You have to uh, collect a very large number of samples, or otherwise uh, you might end up um, having a, a drastic decrease in performance. Um, oops. So they require a lot of samples, and second, it's hard to set the step size. The step size is a kind of arbitrary parameter, and sometimes if you set it properly, um, if you set it properly, at one phase of the problem, I mean, you set it so it's going to work at the beginning of the learning process, and it's uh, it's not working that well at the end of the learning process. Um, so, so those um, it ends up being kind of hard to make uh, these kind of methods work. And actually, for a long time, people thought that policy grading methods uh, weren't weren't actually any good for large scale problems. And um, then they started to realize that you actually you can get them to work, but you have to use a lot of tricks. Um, and uh, some of the tricks are these variance reduction tricks that I talked talk about before. But um, the other set of important tricks are um, are to do something uh, better for the optimization, rather than just computing the gradient and moving in the gradient direction. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about next. And uh, so these are trust gradient and natural gradient methods, which are uh, different ways of improving the optimization. Someone had a question? Well, if you understand how we check, how we check that the, uh, the performance is improving. Oh, uh, so how do you check that the performance is improving? Uh, you just look at the expected reward that you get. Um, so uh, whenever you um, collect a trajectory, um, you can look at the total reward from that trajectory, and then you see if your running average is getting better or worse. Or if you're using a batch method, um, you can just see if um, what was the average reward on that batch, and did it get better or worse? Okay, um, so so basically the two main problems are um, first of all it's hard to choose reasonable step sizes uh, that uh, works for the whole optimization process, um, and the problem here is worse than it is in supervised learning, just because of the fact that in reinforcement learning, as you change your policy, you start collecting different uh, data, um, so. Uh, so that makes it so the problem is not stationary and uh, it's hard to choose a fixed step size. Um, so that's one problem. Um, also, we only have a gradient estimator. Um, we don't actually have an objective um, that we can do a line search on. Um, okay, and that's what I just mentioned, the, the, the statistics change during learning. Um, the other issue is that uh, they are not very efficient with samples because uh, each, uh, each trajectory or each experience uh, is only used once to compute one gradient. So you're collecting a bunch of trajectories, and then you use those trajectories to compute one gradient estimator, and then you take a step in that direction, but you don't do anything else with your data. Um, so one might ask, uh, let's say we just collected a bunch of data, what's the best we can possibly do with this data? Uh, can we write down some optimization problem such that if you just solve this problem with convergence, uh, that's what we really want to do, and that will improve your policy. It's nice when you can uh, separate the, uh, you can uh, write down an objective uh, which, um, which you're trying to optimize at all times, because then you can sort of separate the two problems of optimizing your objective properly and uh, estimating the proper objective. Um, but we haven't, we haven't done that yet. Right now we've just, we've just said how to um, get a gradient estimate. Okay, so yeah, what's the most we can do with our trajectory? So these are the two issues, and um, so so now um, what I'm going to try to what I'm going to work towards over the next few slides is um, is how to write down an objective uh, that we can optimize, and that um, when we optimize it, we'll make an improvement to the policy. So so I want to write down an objective for policy optimization. Um, so that after you collect a batch of trajectories, you can just optimize that objective. Okay, so let's let's first think about the performance of a policy. Um, so eta of pi is going to denote the performance.
performance of the policy, which is just its expected return. And um, there's a needed identity that it satisfies. Um, so uh, normally, we would have to write down, um, we could write down uh, one expectation that tells you the performance of pi tilde, and another expectation that tells us the performance of pi. But then there's this neat identity that shows how to relate the two, um, involving only one expectation. And um, the interpretation of this formula is, um, you just add up how much um, better it is pi tilde do um, at each step of time, and you add up all of those. Um, you add up all those terms. So you say, um, what if we just? I mean, how much? How much better is pi tilde than pi at time step zero? That's this first term. And the second term is how much better is pi, uh, pi tilde on time step one, and so on. That's the interpretation of all these terms. Um, so you can prove this identity. Um, I won't go into the details, it's pretty easy to prove. Um, but the point is just that we have to add up a bunch of, we have to add up a bunch of advantage functions, and uh, that'll tell you how much, um, how much better pi tilde is than pi. Okay. So, so we have this identity for the performance of policy pi tilde, which is based on looking at the advantage function. Um, then we can do some uh, manipulations on this identity. Um, so the problem is, uh, well, the problem is we don't know what to do with this. Uh, I mean, we can look at this, uh, I mean, we don't know what to do with this formula. This formula isn't going to help us optimize pi tilde. I mean, what we're trying to do is we want some kind of formula, some kind of objective involving pi tilde that we're going to be able to optimize. But this formula doesn't work, and the reason is Let's say we break up this expectation into uh, the expectation over states and then the expectation over actions given those states. Um, well, the states depend in some really complicated way on pi tilde. So this expectation is over trajectories collected from pi tilde, and the state distribution that's reached by the policy C pi tilde depends on pi tilde in a complicated way. And that's why, um, that's why it's, we don't know what to do right now. So the way we can do this, so, so here we, we can't do this because um, the state distribution has a complicated dependence on pi tilde. And um, so we can define a local approximation. Um, we can define a function called L sub pi, uh, which is a local approximation to um, eta of pi. So, um, so eta of pi is what we're really trying to optimize, but we can write an approximation that's good right around pi but then it becomes bad when you move too far away from it. Um, so, so the way we make this local approximation is we just ignore how the state distribution uh, depends on the policy. So, um, so in, this approximate, in this local approximation, on the outside we have an expectation over states that are collected from our pi, which is our old policy, which this is like our reference policy that we're trying to improve on. And then uh, we have an expectation over actions coming from the, uh, the new policy, pi tilde. So basically, let me just make, uh, let me just emphasize that what we're trying to do here is we have this policy pi, and we're trying to improve on it to get a better policy pi tilde. So what we're going to try to do is write down an objective, um, an objective function uh, that's a function of pi tilde and tells us um, some estimate of how good pi tilde is. So we write down this local approximation, and then um, it involves an expectation over actions of the advantage function. So expectation over actions taken from pi tilde of the advantage function. And then we can um, use accordance sampling to write it as a ratio of probabilities. And then finally, we get this formula that just takes, um, I mean, this is the important one at the end. So we have an expectation over trajectories taken from our old policy. And then we have, um, we have some probability ratio times the advantage under the old policy. And that's just telling you uh, how much better is action A than what the old policy pi would have done. So this, this is a local approximation to the performance of policy, the policy pi tilde, and it's valid for pi tilde near pi. Um, so, so now let's move to the world of parameterized policies. Um, so um, 
we can write this um, in terms of th uh, theta, which is the policy parameter. So we have our old parameter, um, theta sub old, and then we have, we're trying to find what's the um, performance we, we would get from a new parameter called theta. And we write down, uh, all, we, all I did here is I just converted everything to the uh, notation of parameterized policies. So this is what our formula looks like. And um, the nice thing is, when we differentiate this formula um, um, and evaluate it at theta old, we get the policy gradient. So, uh, so we we took um, we evaluate this. This should say we eva we're evaluating it at theta old. Yeah. In the function, uh, uh, that's theta old. You're right. That's a theta old. Um, so, yeah. So we have this objective um, that. Uh, where we're, um, I mean, we had this objective that we came up with, and uh, that, that's what was derived previous, on the previous couple slides, and it's kind of complicated, but, but the important point is that when we differentiate this objective, we get the policy gradient. So you can forget about the pre, don't worry too much about the derivation. The point is that we're writing down an objective um, that when you differentiate it, you get the policy gradient. So it's, a, it's, it's correct, it matches the actual performance of the policy to first order. So it's, it's just like a local approximation uh, to the performance of the policy. Okay, so, so here's, um, here's the theorem. Um, oh, so actually, before I say the theorem, I'll say, um, so it's a local approximation, meaning um, if you take an infinite, I mean, it's, gonna, it's correct to first order, which means it should be pretty good if you take a really small step. So if you take a sufficiently small step in a policy gradient that, uh, direction, uh, you're guaranteed to improve the performance because it's, this thing's correct to first order. But that doesn't tell you how to take a step of any um, reasonable finite size. So, so now it turns out that there's a, a theorem um, that actually um, tells you how you can take a finite size step to the, um, I mean, to update the policy and uh, guarantee that you improved it. So, so the theorem is that uh, we can write down a lower bound for the performance of the policy. So the, basically, if we uh, subtract out this penalty uh, for changing the policy, um, then we get something that's guaranteed to be a lower bound on the, the policy. And so it's a lower bound, but uh, at theta equals theta old, it's exactly, these things are exactly equal. So they're, they're exactly equal at the starting point, at theta old. But um, when you move away from theta old, um, this left, right hand side is a lower bound on the left hand side. And um, so this is, this is the KL divergence uh, between uh, the old policy and uh, the new policy maximized over state space. So it's basically saying, um, if we change the policy a lot, then we might have made it worse. So um, the, because uh, basically the crux of the issue is, the, the crux of the problem is that um, the uh, advantage function tells us um, I mean, we're, we're ignoring the change to the state distribution of the policy. That's how we derived this um, local approximation. We ignored how the state distribution is changing. Uh, but that means that our formula, or the local approximation starts to get bad when the state distribution changes a lot. Um, so if we bound, uh, so basically if we're really pessimistic and we assume that, uh, that when you um, go outside of the original state distribution, then something really bad is going to happen. Uh, then you end up with this formula. So this is how you get you derive a formula. You, you're really pessimistic, and you say, um, "What's when we're outside of our original state distribution? Really bad stuff is going to happen." Um, and uh, then you end up with a formula that says that uh, if you um, there's a penalty for changing your your policy, um, and it's it's given by the KL divergence between the old and the new policy. Okay, so that's. Uh, that's the formula we get, and um, so now the reason that's really good is, is um, let's draw a little picture to say why this is useful for optimization. So, so here's this red curve is the thing we're actually trying to optimize, the performance of the policy. And then uh, if we just make our local approximation, it's equal to the, it's exactly right um, to first order, uh, right around our starting point. Um, but then as we start to go further away, it becomes really wrong. And um, if we were to just try to maximize this green curve, we might go over to infinity 
in the like way over here. So we're going to take too big of a step. Um, but instead, if we write, this should be minus constant times KL divergence. If we write down this lower bound, so it's a lower bound on the red curve, then if we optimize this blue curve, then we're guaranteed to make the improvement to the red curve. We're guaranteed to make more improvement on the red curve than we did on the blue curve. So that's, that's the idea here. Since we wrote down a lower bound uh, to, to the objective, which is exactly equal to it at the starting point, then we're guaranteed that if we optimize this lower bound, then we're uh, making an improvement to the, to the thing we care about. Any questions? So this is called the um, minorization maximization algorithm. And the EM algorithm is, this, is another case for this. OK, uh, yeah. so, so just reviewing what we've done, we want to optimize this, uh, this performance of the policy data. We collected data with our old policy. And now um, we want to do an update. Uh, so we derived this local approximation, which is good right around the old policy. And uh, if we optimize this KL, this local approximation minus the KL divergence penalty, then we're guaranteed to get an improvement uh, to our actual performance. Um, so there, the algorithm that we would get by just implementing what was on the previous slide is still a little impractical because it involves a max over state space. And um, we also have to do some sampling. Uh, but we can derive a practical algorithm to it by making some approximations. Uh, so instead of taking a max over state space, we take a mean, and there's some justification for that. Um, we make a linear approximation to the objective and a quadratic approximation to the KL divergence in order to compute a step. Um, though we're still going to do a line search on the original problem. Um, and then we can use a hard constraint on the KL divergence instead of a penalty. Um, because it's hard to set a penalty coefficient um, because it's not really interpretable. Um, because we have this reward, um, yeah, we have reward and we're trying to trade off between that and KL divergence. It's not really interpretable. Uh, whereas if you have a fixed value for the KL divergence, well, that's, um, that's a unitless quantity that's easy to interpret. It's just um, the KL divergence has units of bits. So it turns out that you can um, choose a particular value for this parameter that works on a whole wide range of problems that, are, uh, that have just really widely different dimensionalities. Um, so so that's, those are the changes. So we're going to solve this problem approximately, where we're maximizing our um, objective subject to a KL divergence constraint. And uh, we can do a, we can solve this approximately using one, um, by doing the quadratic and linear approximation. And then um, that gives us a search direction. And then we can do a line search in that direction. So, so what we do is we collect a batch of data. Um, we, then we plug in all the data into these, um, into these formulas. Uh, I'll talk about that on the next slide. And then we're going to do a line search. Um, and this natural gradient was actually proposed a, a while back by uh, Sean Kukad, but it um, didn't take off for a while. Well, actually, I should say it's been used a lot. It's, and people have used it, recognize that these kind of methods work a lot better than just a regular um, uh, policy gradient methods. OK, so let's see. Oh, I didn't say anything. OK, so, so basically, the, the way this works in practice is you collect a bunch of data with your old policy. You um, collect estimates of the advantage function, and um, then you plug them into this this function, this uh, objective, and also the KL divergence, and then you um, uh, then you solve that optimization problem. So, so that's this algorithm called TRPO, um, and uh, so this um, so this is some work that my colleagues and I did. Um, we um, used it with neural network policies, so the. Um, so for a uh, discrete action space, um, if you have a neural network policy in a discrete action space, like the Atari games, um, so in the Atari games, you have like uh, 10 moves or so, and it's like left, right, fire, um, so on. And uh, you get images, screen images as input. Um, and so we, we had a, a neural network that takes in the screen image, and it outputs the probability of all the actions. Um, and then. For the continuous control tasks, these are uh, 2D robots that are supposed to swim, hop, and walk. And there we have a neural network that outputs the mean over mean of a Gaussian distribution, and also has parameters for the standard deviations. 
Um, so, oh yeah, so that we applied them to these tasks um, in that work. And then, uh, so we also um, later applied it to uh, generalized advantage estimation. Uh, I mean, we applied it to three robot tasks uh, with also using this uh, generalized advantage estimation, which was the variance reduction technique I talked about um, in a previous slide. And I'll actually show you a video of that. Um, let's see. I'll show a video of what the learned uh, policies look like. Okay, so here um, we're just showing what's the policy doing on each iteration. So we have this humanoid robot, and uh, the reward function is just to um, move forward as fast as possible without falling over. Um, and uh, it just has like 15 um, different uh, torques that it can control, and it's controlling its torques at about 100 hertz, so it's pretty high frequency. This is just raw, like um, it's taking in the joint angles as input. There's a neural network taking in joint angles as input and then outputting the, uh, outputting the joint torques um, at 100 hertz. So there's basically no information given to it, and uh, it just uh, figures out how to walk um, pretty stably. And then you can also apply the exact same algorithm just on some other random robot model. Um, like uh, this is just this four-legged robot that my colleague Philip uh, made, and uh, it's, um, it just figures out how to make this thing walk. And, you don't even know what it's going to do before you run the algorithm. So, like when you come up with one of these, it's kind of fun because you have the, um, like you just come up with the robot model and uh, you don't know if it's going to walk the way you expect it to walk. And usually it doesn't. So, so this thing figured out that it should turn sideways and like use one as the head and one as the tail. Okay, so you can also, we just, there we were applying it to learn how to walk, but you can also teach it how to learn how to stand up off the ground. Uh, so here you just give it a reward function based on how high its head is above the ground, and uh, it just figures out what to do. And this all took, um, so, um, so you might ask, like, how long does it take to learn this stuff? Uh, does it take just a ridiculous amount of samples? Could you run this on a real robot? So I would say it's sort of on the border of what would actually be practical or not. Um, it's, this ends up taking like two weeks of real time if you add up all the time it takes. So if you were to just have a robot in your factory and you're uh, like every time it falls over, you just are running it 24 hours a day, it would take about two weeks to learn how to walk. So it's not that bad. It would probably break before then for any real robot you buy. Um, but I would say that maybe with like another Maybe with some more, um, some more like engineering and stuff, and some more, a few more ideas, you could get it down to something that's quite practical. <laughs> okay, so so now I'm gonna, um, I'm just gonna try to put this um, this stuff that I've just been talking about into perspective into, and talk about uh, how does this fit in with all the other methods that people have proposed uh, for doing this kind of reinforcement learning. And, um, and then I'm going to talk about some open problems in reinforcement learning. Um, so we've been talking about one particular line of work. So this line of work is uh, how do you take policy gradient methods and just, um, just make them work a lot better. So, you take, um, so first of all, you do lots of variance reduction, and then you try to make the optimization work better by using these stress region ideas. So that was this one, that was one line of work. Um, and, and I showed you some results um, that my colleagues and I got doing that. Um, actually, people have also, so there is also some work at, uh, from DeepMind, uh, this paper um, called Async, uh, where is it? Um, did I cite it? 14. Oh yeah, uh, well I gave the wrong citation here, but uh, there's a paper called Asynchronous Methods in Deep Reinforcement Learning. So they actually show that if you use a regular policy gradient method, you can learn some uh, fairly complicated tasks um, uh, if you just use it, if you just crush it with a lot of samples. Um, so, uh, so I guess that's a proof that it's actually possible um, if you just use a huge number of samples. Um, <coughs> Let's see. 
Uh, so then, and there's also this reparameterization trick, uh, still sort of in the framework of policy gradient methods, but, but it has a little bit of a different flavor. Um, so that's what we've got in the world of policy gradient methods. Then there's also a bunch of work on uh, Q learning. Um, that's a totally different kind of algorithm that I haven't talked about, but uh, this algorithm works um, by just uh, trying to learn the Q function. So I talked about Q functions a little bit, um, and Q learning algorithms uh, work by, instead of just trying to um, optimize a policy really well, they try to get a really accurate Q function. And um, if you have the right Q, if you learn the perfect Q function, then you automatically get a perfect policy. Um, so that's, that's a different kind of approach, um, and there's been some nice work on that, uh, mostly on the Atari domain, not so much on robotics or other kinds of tasks, um, because it seems to have some problem with uh, continuous action spaces or um, other kinds of state spaces, or certain kinds of input spaces. Um, and uh, actually there's another set of interesting methods that are, are a little bit different in terms of what assumptions they make about the problem, but are seem to be quite promising. So there are a bunch of methods that are combining search with supervising. Um, so if you have a good uh, model of the system, you can run a search algorithm. And uh, that means there are different kinds of search algorithms. Uh, you have tree search algorithms where, so this is like how chess programs work, where you just uh, construct a big tree of different possibilities and uh, you um, then you work your way uh, upwards from the leaves of the tree and figure out how good all your different states are. Um, so there are tree search algorithms and there's also trajectory optimization algorithms where uh, you can just uh, say, let's look at one trajectory of what am I going to do in the future from this starting state and you can optimize that one trajectory. So, so these are search algorithms that are not learning policies, they're just learning what am I supposed to do in one, uh, in one place. And, when you, and the nice thing about these algorithms is they're really good at finding, uh, they're really good at solving for a good sequence of, um, sequence of actions. They don't require any learning to get a good sequence of actions. So, uh, so there have been a bunch of uh, nice works using um, combining search and supervised learning. So, so, one, so there was a, a nice paper that uh, used uh, search, um, they used a tree search um, to learn how to, to uh, I mean, to play Atari and then uh, they train the policy. Uh, so basically the way they work is you run a search algorithm to gather a bunch of training data, and then you just use supervised learning to fit a policy uh, to that, um, to basically, to the um, actions that the search was choosing. So the search gives you like a really good action at each state, and then you just use supervised learning to train on, on that. So yeah, there are a bunch of um, works doing that. Um, either using tree search or um, using trajectory optimization. Um, so uh, actually my colleagues at Berkeley, not me, but um, Sergey Levin and Chelsea Finn, uh, they had um, some really nice work. Uh, it's called end-to-end -end training of deep uh, visual motor policies where, where they, um, they use this kind of idea for, to learn pretty fast on a real robot um, where you're doing trajectory optimization and then you train a policy to reproduce what the trajectory optimizer was doing. And, um, and then there was some other work by uh, Igor Mordach, which is, um, which, which is also using this idea in a different uh, set of problems. Um, so yeah, this, these kind of methods make this slightly different kind of assumption about, they, they use some more, um, it, it's a little less general than what kind of problems you can apply it to, but it seems like uh, it can be quite good on, in the problems where it does apply. Let's see. Okay, so that's sort of what's out there in terms of uh, just different deep RL algorithms. This isn't like everything that's happening in deep RL, but this is just um, to just give it the spectrum of different algorithms out there, um, like as your basic algorithm. Um, so, um, what are the open uh, problems in uh, that I see? This is um, just my own uh, opinion here. So, so one question is just what's the right uh, core um, model-free reinforcement learning algorithm. So all these algorithms I've talked about so far, with the possible exception of the last one, uh, with the search plus supervised learning, are model-free algorithms, which means that they don't really have a model of the dynamics of the system. They don't try to learn anything about the, the system. Uh, they just uh, they just sort of work by uh, collecting lots of um, 
they just collect lots of um, lots of data and try to improve the policy or improve the Q function. So there's another, so basically what's the right core algorithm to use? And we have policy gradients versus Q learning versus um, the kind of algorithms I was talking about at the beginning, these derivative free algorithms. Uh, so it's not clear right now which, which of these methods is going to win in the long run. Um, and uh, in fact, I would say there's no algorithm that satisfies all of the desiderata that we want. So why not, I mean, so the properties we want are it should be scalable, um, meaning you can run it with a really big policy and it'll, and a really high dimensional, like high dimensional action space, uh, high dimensional observations, and it'll work. Um, it should be scalable, sample efficient, robust, and uh, last, it should be able to learn from off policy data, meaning that if you have data that was um, not collected by the policy itself, but um, by um, either like a, an expert, it was like a demonstration from an expert, or it was um, collected from a, like a noise, maybe, well, I'll talk about exploration later, but sometimes you want to not just take your best um, guess of what's the best action right now, you want to just try a random action that you think has a chance of being good. So, um, so you want to be able to learn from data that wasn't collected from your policy um, for, for a number of reasons. And I would say that the, um, yeah, none of the methods uh, that are out there right now really, I would say, none of them really satisfy these properties. They all satisfy some of them, but not all of them. So for example, the policy grading methods, uh, the regular policy grading methods don't really, um, well they are, I would say they're definitely scalable, um, they're not very sample efficient, uh, they're not very robust, and they can't learn from off policy data. Then I would say the TRPO is more sample efficient and more robust. It's less scalable though because um, it happens, there's, there's something weird going on when, where you use like a, a bigger um, neural network as your policy and then performance gets worse. So, so I don't totally think it's, uh, it's as scalable as it should be and it doesn't work off policy. Um, Q learning is, uh, works a little bit off policy but not really. Um, so, and it's not really that um, robust. It's a little more sample efficient than policy gradients. But, so there are a bunch of trade-offs, and I would say none of them are really um, good enough. Okay, so that's that's just the core algorithm, but then there are a lot of other issues that are sort of orthogonal, or partly orthogonal to that. Um, so one big one is exploration. Um, so the idea is um, when, uh, so the idea of exploration is to, um, you, you wanna um, actively um, encourage uh, the agent to reach unfamiliar parts of state space. Um, so if you if you just run any of these RL algorithms, you'll find that it often just gets stuck in some bad local optimal behavior. Uh, like you're trying to get this robot to learn how to walk, and uh, maybe, I mean, to be able to walk properly, you have to do a lot of things right. And it might find that um, it's just falling all the time and it's just gonna give up on trying to walk and just stand up and not bother walking. And um, Maybe that'll um, like prevent it from getting really bad rewards and by falling over. But in the long run, it's never going to solve for the, the correct behavior, which has maximum rewards. So it's really easy to get stuck in local, uh, local at a local maximum. And um, of course, in optimization, you can never hope to get to do global optimization well, very well. But in reinforcement learning, there are actually some relevant theoretical results uh, that say that actually say that exploration helps you in a, in a meaningful. Theoretical, theoretical sense. So if you have finite MEPs, um, it turns out there are algorithms that will solve a totally unknown MDP um, just, by, um, just from sampled experience um, in a polynomial time. And these algorithms all work by um, doing some kind of exploration. Uh, for example, um, being optimistic about what's going to happen at new states and actions, or um, having some kind of distribution over possible models. Um, so, so exploration is sort of well um, justified theoretically um, in the finite MVP setting. And um, there's now a question of how to do this in the setting where you have function approximation, where you're just uh, getting high dimensional observations for your, uh, you're getting high dimensional observations and you have a high dimensional policy, which is some kind of neural network. Um, so, so there's a question of how to, how to have robust and effective exploration strategies in this setting. Um, another big problem is um, how to have a hierarchy. 
Um, so here's what that means is um, we would like to have, uh, there are lots of different time scales where you might want to choose actions. And, uh, if, and uh, if you don't uh, account for this, then your learning is going to take forever. So um, if you think about uh, like a typical robot or um, some kind of uh, something acting in the real world, uh, they're going to be uh, just, you have to account for dependencies over uh, millions or, or more time, like just a large number of time steps. So you, you might, for a robot, you might want to do torque control at uh, like 10 million, uh, at 100 hertz, which is 10 million time steps per day. And then you're planning footsteps at about 100,000 time steps per day. And then maybe you have high level actions like walk to some location or fetch some object uh, uh, at several th uh, thousand per day. And then, yeah, then at a, the highest level you have tasks like I'm going to go to this and I'm going to go to that and so on. Uh, so if you were to just try to solve it at the, this finest uh, granularity, um, then um, it would just be way too hard because of this uh, delayed reward problem. Uh, like your estimate, like your policy grading, if you use a policy grading method, your policy grading estimator is just going to have huge variance because you're just confounding together the effect, effect of 10 million actions. So that's not going to work. And it seems like you should be able to do some kind of learning on many different time scales at once. Um, but how to do this in a generic way where you actually learn the different um, high level actions, uh, no one's really uh, proposed a plausible way to do this. Um, there's been lots of different ideas, but no one really figured out how to learn the different uh, high level <coughs> actions um, from scratch. Okay, and then I'll just mention a couple briefly. Uh, so one is using learned models um, to just, uh, so using, um, so I've just talked about model-free reinforcement learning. You can also do model-based reinforcement learning where you're also learning a model with system and, um, and then you're using that model for planning or to speed up your learning somehow. And um, there's a lot of reason to believe that those model-based methods could be really sample efficient. Uh, because if you think about uh, what you do as a human, um, you, you usually don't have to learn uh, a lot of things by trial and error. Sometimes you can just get it right the first time by thinking through what's going to happen. Uh, like, um, maybe uh, you have to get, um, you, uh, you need to um, buy some more, um, you need to buy some more tomatoes, and um, you, you're not sure, you have to decide which supermarket to go to, and then you have to, then you don't have to like go to all the supermarkets, um, or go to all the stores in your neighborhood before figuring out where to go. You already have a model of the world where you know like which stores have tomatoes in them. Uh, so you can use that model to just do the right thing the first time. So it's, there's good reason to believe that models should help you uh, learn a lot faster, but um, there's a question of how to, do, how to use those, use learned models in uh, deep reinforcement learning, where these are like you're using really flexible function approximators for your models. Uh, okay, and another um, question of uh, another current research topic is how to learn from demonstrations. Um, so uh, you can somehow um, use uh, some demonstrations of how to perform a task and then, then run a reinforcement learning algorithm that takes those in somehow and then fine tunes your policy, which will hopefully achieve, the re use those as a hint and hopefully achieve the same result. Um, so that's, that's it. Uh, thanks for your attention. You can sort of quantify how, uh, to what extent it actually works off policy. Uh, so you can just take data that was collected from a fixed policy and uh, try to fit a Q function to that and then run the policy that you got, that uh, run the policy that results from that Q function. And usually it's not very good. Uh, so, so that means that it's, uh, it's, it's not really, um, yeah, in practice it doesn't seem uh, that Q learning uh, is able to use off policy data very well. Actually, another thing that people have tried is uh, you have a demonstration of how to um, succeed really well at the task. 
and you include that in your data that you're fitting the Q function to. So you would think that the Q function would just uh, would be able to use that demonstration data and do really well, but empirically it just uh, doesn't happen. So it seems like empirically it doesn't actually work off policy, at least in the function approximation set. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the line Function approximation by neural networks. Mm -hmm. So it seems like in neural networks, all the like good optimization methods are based on the tool. Mm -hmm. And it's how this compares to the tool. Okay, yeah, so. Uh, what? Can you repeat it? Yeah, yeah. So the question is um, on. So I uh, proposed to do a line search for, uh, for this uh, trust region algorithm. And, um, but it seems like uh, all the effective met optimization methods people use for neural networks uh, use momentum. Uh, so, and they don't use uh, line searches. No one uses line searches for neural networks. Yeah, so that's correct. And I would say, um, I would say uh, it, it does work. It, I mean, doing a line search works. And, uh, and since this is a, um, because of the, the natural, doing a natural gradient step, you sort of reduce the need for momentum because um, you're, uh, I mean, uh, you're getting a good search direction from, it's, it's, it's a second order method. Um, well, it's sort of a second order method and uh, momentum sort of brings you closer from a, from a first order method to a second order method where it reduces the effect of poor conditioning. Um, and this also reduces the effect of poor conditioning in a different way. So, uh, so I would say that um, since you're using, since it's a second order method, that reduces the need for momentum. On the other hand, I would say it's not ideal that you have to do this line search for a neural network because uh, then you are prone to overfitting on your, your current batch of data. There is a question over. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you get a Yeah, okay, so the question, so the proposal was uh, we, want, uh, we want to add uh, two more desiderata to what the ideal model free RL algorithm should do. So first, it should be interpretable, and second, you should be able to uh, transfer it between the two. Uh, so yeah, I agree. Um, I, I agree with both of those. Well, I think for interpretability, that might be a property of the function approximator, largely instead of the algorithm. But on the other hand, it's also possible that the algorithm would give you would tell you something like uh, if, if you use, a, use a model, it might think this action is good because here's what I'm going to do next. And then the other one is uh, uh, having um, being able to uh, being able to compose these things together. Uh, I think yeah, that's uh, I think to some extent you should be able to do that uh, with any of these methods because uh, you you should be able to learn a uh, well. You should be able to transfer a policy from one domain to another. Uh, for, uh, I mean, people have actually done this to some extent. Um, for example, on Atari, to get the policy to play multiple games. Um, but, but yeah, you're right that maybe that that's something worth thinking about. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank John for for his lecture. Thank you.